I know. Yeah, this. I mean, this could lead a whole rabbit hole, right? This is like a, well, whole, yeah. a whole rabbit hole. So <laughs> we yeah, like to try to make people think. Welcome, everyone, to the August 2024 edition of The Impact, a sustainable CT podcast for your edification, your enlightenment, and your entertainment, too. I'm Jim Hunt, Communications Manager at Sustainable CT, so if you're looking for someone to blame for this podcast, well, you can blame me. But remember, this is never a one-way conversation. We always want to hear from you for our edification and enlightenment. Drop us a note, won't you, to info at sustainablect.org. The Impact is brought to you in part by the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut. That's right, the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut brings people together to work towards a healthy, thriving, and sustainable Eastern Connecticut, and we are oh so glad they do. Visit them at cfect.org. Remember, Sustainable CT is independently funded. We don't have a magical rainbow unicorn money tree, no sir, but you can be a Sustainable CT sponsor. Find out how at sustainablect.org. Dot O-R-G. We're delighted to be joined today by James Osborne, founder and partner of Invest Asset Management, one of a new breed of socially responsible investment funds. Invest Asset Management, EAM, if you prefer, is an independent fiduciary fee-only investment advisor, a certified B corporation, and a 1% for the planet member. Invest follows sustainable investing in environmental, social, and governance practices. The Envest mission statement reads in part, while we want to respect and preserve our planet, we're also obligated to respect, preserve, and grow our assets and provide a secure future for our families, which seems like an eminently reasonable approach, and yet not all that common in the world of American capitalism. Uh, James's roots run deep in sustainability and environmental and socially responsible investing and financial planning. His experience includes a career as an environmental engineer, investment banker, and clean energy and as a private equity fund manager at a clean energy-focused fund. Prior to starting Invest Asset Management, James spent the bulk of his career with Wall Street institutions and lived to tell about it. (laughs) Having raised, placed, or invested a billion dollars in socially responsible investing, he's been a guest lecturer and panelist at various clean energy-related conferences and an educator on on sustainable investing. I understand you're an avid runner, too, which is I, I very am. cool. And James earned his MBA from the Simon Business School at the University of Rochester. Go Yellow Jackets. That's right. <laughs> he, he earned his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Villanova, home of the Mighty Wildcats, mm-hmm. uh, where he was a Division One track and field cross-country athlete. My son's a, uh, was a track athlete. God, so it, that's very cool. I love that. Uh, mm-hmm. James also studied wealth management theory and practice at the Yale School of Management. And, you know, we love our bulldogs. We do. Right. And James Osborne has been a friend and supporter of Sustainable CT, for which we are especially grateful. So welcome to the show, James. And uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to chat with you. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thanks for having me. You got all that out of the way. Let's get to some questions because I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of Forgive me, mixing capitalism, at least the the investment side of it, with social responsibility, particularly sustainability. Right. And I'm counting on you to help me see beyond what I imagine, well, I might be forgiven as seeing as the oil and water of the mix. Mm -hmm. I suppose you have a different approach to that. I'm hoping, I'm assuming you do. No, no. Well, (laughs) well, absolutely. As as a matter of fact, when when I decided to start Envest, it was a few years back now uh, when I started putting pen to paper and I just kind of said, there's got to be a better way. How can I impart, you know, some of the skills that I've gained throughout my career to help people more personally and help people that are in situations that could use help? So, you know, a, a lot of wealth advisors might say something along the lines of, you know, we need certain minimums and, and we do have certain minimums, but we also bring in a lot of other clients. Um, and other, we help other people without minimums. But the but the point of it all is, is yes, I, I believe that there is a better way of doing business. It doesn't have to be all about capitalism. Although, don't get me wrong. I mean, we need to live. I understand that we need to pay Absolutely. bills, and mm-hmm. we have to support our families and our friends and and society and community. It's just that there are organizations out there, companies out there, 
that I believe do it better. So we try to yeah. we try to weed that out, try to support those companies or try to, in certain instances, companies that have a service that we kind of fundamentally need, we hope that we can kind of push them as an investor to go more towards that sustainability angle. Sure. Think about environmental and social issues when actually creating products. Well, and, and I've said on this, this show before, I've told anybody who would listen, I, used, I come from the private sector myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've not always been in, in the nonprofit world. And, uh, but the companies I've worked for have been, we've been very progressive companies. We all shared certain values and we tried to live those values. Now, you know, we still have to feed our family. We still have right. to send our kids to college. We still got a mortgage to pay. We still have all the things. Uh, and yeah, I'm, nobody's getting rich doing this. So, <laughs> you know, we do the best we can. We still have to try to worry about the bottom line. It's, it's, it's how and where we live. So if, as long if we can, uh, do the right thing. We used to say it's good and good for you. You know, if we could do the right thing mm-hmm. and still find a way to live uh, and grow and prosper in, uh, in, our, in our lives and for our kids, that's and somehow protect the future. Oh, <laughs> the planet um, needs protecting. Let me ask yeah. you, let me ask you the, just to define terms for us, because I get a little mixed up on this, too, and I don't know what to mm-hmm. tell people. The, uh, invest, uh, what you folks do sometimes almost simultaneously referred to as socially responsible investing or sustainable investing or ESG, which is, I guess, following environmental, social governance practices. Do these labels mean anything different? Are they, what, what give me some definition of terms. Yeah, yeah you know, that's really interesting. Um, yes, it was kind of born out of, I guess, the different decades along the lines of like corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility, and now there's environmental social governance. I'd say socially responsible investing might be, I'd say maybe inclusive slash exclusive. So if you were to look at an organization, you might say, Exxon, I don't care about oil and gas. I want them out of my portfolio. That's exclusive. And then you might, you know, more inclusive would be, okay, well, let's look at a solar you know, a solar uh, company. Sure. So that's that's kind of along those lines. Uh, at least that's how it's more defined today. Uh, per- personally, I just use sustainable investing or values based investing. Okay. If you want to, if you want to invest based off of your values, and your values might be more socially aligned, more community aligned. Let's try to do that. If your values are more environmentally aligned, let's try to do that. But without uh, disregarding you know, the whole idea of like risk tolerance and balanced portfolio. But, you know, I mean, in all, like I kind of lump them all together nowadays. ESG is more about environmental and social uh, actual metrics that company uses to help determine whether or not they're making a better environmental or social impact. And then the G part is the governance. It's kind of like, okay, how do we implement that through our managers and employees? Yeah. You you mentioned metrics, so I'm going to jump a little bit to the question I had about metrics. And one of the major challenges to socially responsible investing that I've read about is try, a lack of standardized metrics and, and people r- reporting frameworks for assessing environmental and social impact. Mm-hmm. Do you see that as an issue, or have you been able to clarify some of that in what you do? No, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Well, at one point, I thought that that was probably the biggest issue. I do think that there's a bigger issue now. We'll see how it plays out, but we'll, we'll probably tackle that in a little bit later. I do think that that's a big issue. I don't think it's the biggest issue nowadays. Um, there are organizations, SASB, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. There's GRI, Global Reporting Initiative. Okay. There are UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And they're all kind of, well, GRI and SASB are definitely more defined. Sustainable de- development goals are are a bit more loose. But those do help provide at least guidance uh, along those types of, of types of standardization. I would love to see more standardization as well. It'll just make it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but what I do try to do is uh, the organization that helps me, me and my partner figure out, you know, what we might want to invest in on behalf of our clients um, is an organization called Sustainalytics. And they're actually, um, I think they're partially owned by Morningstar. We also use Morningstar to help us figure out. Well, that's things. dropping so a name. Morningstar yeah. is, you know, is the player in, in statistical analysis and investing. So if they're yeah. attached with them, it makes perfect sense. Sure. It, well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you need it. You know, there's so, I mean, there's so many products out there, right? Yeah. So, so we use them 
to help us figure out whether or not. And we believe that there's there's two reasons for that. One, we believe that what they're doing is 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 a good metric, but then also rather than trying to do this is more apples to apples because we have one framework using Morningstar or Sustainalytics um, rather than trying to like pick and choose from all these different, you know, all these different companies that create these products. So that those are the ones that we've used so far, mm-hmm. but it is, it is definitely an issue. And I, I'd say it used to be, you know, one of the top issues, but I do think that people are getting better at identifying those types of risks. It, it, so. it feels uh, from a, a layman's perspective if i'm just watching this you know listening to marketplace or doing the things that normal people do i'm not i'm not that deep into it i try but not my bailiwick right and the stuff that i hear is it, it's all, it sounds like so much smoke and mirrors half the time it's like we're gonna we're gonna this represents sustainability credits over here but don't look too closely because it has to you know this has to happen it just feels like it's a moving target constantly mm-hmm. which which and I understand why that is. This is a, this is this can be really fuzzy math uh, a lot of the times, and we deal with that ourselves. It's a, it's a really difficult thing. Uh, one of my major complaints in working in this organization in, in sustainability is we have the, devil, the devil's own time trying to measure our impact. Yeah, oh yeah. We can do that, you know, through the obvious. You say, well, how many dollars did you save on your energy bill? You know, Tom mm-hmm. Meriden. Uh, you know, we we try to attribute. You, know, actual, you just actual, you just took my example. Yeah, that's that's really easy to pinpoint, right? Like solar is really you know easy to uh, when you're talking about equity, or when you're talking mm-hmm. about composting, or when you're talking about all the things, the different things that we have our fingers in. It's really hard to measure some of that impact, and it and it, it drives us crazy because we know, we yeah. know. I think you you can identify with this. We know that in, intuitively, if we could show those those numbers with confidence, it would, it would be uh, to our credit, right? right, say, right. Oh yeah. You're really having a major impact here. Mm-hmm. We know that in our, in our bones, but it's really yep. hard to get to pin that down. Do, do you find that you get on the other side of the investment challenge? People are wary. They say, well, I want to do this, but uh, how do I know that what I'm investing in is truly socially responsible how do you how do you come how do you answer that question is there a way right. to- no that that that's a that's a good question um so nearly all of our clients came to us because they they believe that there's a better way to do things right so they do trust us and as a fiduciary I, you know i'm legally obligated to try to do my best on behalf of my clients yeah uh so yeah i mean the one thing that we always try to do is we try to do better we can't promise the moon so for example, a typical portfolio might have 10 to 15% of their portfolio invested in things that are in fossil fuels. And in some cases, if they specifically say, get me out of oil and gas, I don't want Chevron or an Exxon right. or any other right. on, um, <laughs> get, me, get me out, then we'll try our best to do it. But in most cases, we say, I don't think we can get you fully out because there's so many, everything is so integrated nowadays. Yeah. That um, and and portfolios to the way portfolios are created nowadays, or you know maybe historically, managers of portfolios. I'm talking like you know your big ones like your Fidelities and your Vanguards and your Black Rocks. They do a lot of screening as well to get these things out, but they can't they can't get everything out. Sure. Um, so we try our best. So we can go from let's say a ten or fifteen percent portfolio that has oil and gas, we could get it down to maybe under 5% or 2%, you know, or 1%. So okay. we try our best. So we're always trying to, <laughs> this is a this University of Rochester. It's like a million always better. We try to do better, right? That's their, that's their saying. So <laughs> well, that's good. Always yeah, try we, to do better. I mean, I hear you though, even though even a big oil has, uh, has gotten into the, in, in theory, environmentally conscious energy, you know, they're looking to do renewables, uh, mm-hmm. They know they see the writing on the wall, yeah. right? I mean, they they have to be in renewables now because that's the future of energy. You know, mm-hmm. you know, you know it, 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 it's it, it's a little difficult to discern. Well, who are the bad guys? Who are the bad actors? And who are the good actors here on this stage? And it, it, I can see how that's very difficult. To yeah, yeah, we we do try we do try our best. I mean, at one point, uh, BP their slogan was uh, beyond yeah. petroleum. I mean, what was that? Maybe 15, 20 years ago or something like that. And they were yeah. trying to push for, you know, ethanol or, uh, oh, what was it? Yeah. It was like, um, 
I want to say algae based ethanol or something like that, right? Yeah. So it was it was unique and and cutting edge, but I don't think they ever how far they took it, <laughs> you know, taking it. But <laughs> well, and that brings up another question: it, the whole notion, and we run into this a lot, and so the term means something to us: greenwashing. Mm-hmm. A lot of companies come to us and uh, or or they're they're players. I don't want to besmirch. I should be careful here. Right. There are people who come to work with us in hopes of greenwashing themselves. You know, mm-hmm. they want to be associated with sustainable CT because it looks good. And they can show that they have, they're trying to do something over here. And, you know, uh, whether it's in equity, uh, look, I've tried, did my, did my equity work. So now I'm a good person. And there's a certain amount of cringiness with that. Right. Do you, do you run into that on both sides of this equation where there are yeah. investors or investments that may be, you know, Ooh. Yeah, I mean, greenwashing. It can it can be an issue. I would say uh, consumers um, in general. Well, there's there's two things with consumers. One, I think that they believe that I think consumers are smart at identifying people that are disingenuous. You know, people that might be lying or pushing the envelope a little bit too much. Yeah. Uh, so they identify, and then two, I think consumers can also um, quickly nowadays with social media, right? I mean, you can quickly find out. If someone's doing something wrong, or an organization's doing something wrong, they don't like it. I mean, they'll hear about it really fast, right? Mm. So that's yeah. very interesting, especially from a communications marketing point of view. I mean, I often look at these companies with profound just, what do you think it? You think mm-hmm. we don't we don't read through that? Do you think that we we can't find out what you're really about? You put right. It, it, it's like. I don't think I don't think some of these folks have caught up with uh, the technology. Maybe I, I don't know. They're not fully aware. Of- that could certainly be part of it. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> my mission um, and my partner when when we do business with people, there's there's kind of levels that we go through. Um, I always try to look for local if I can find local. Yeah. If I can't find local, then I'll do you know B Corp uh, and one percent for the planet. You know, like it's like it's kind of like that sphere it kind of grows over time. And then if you can't find that, it's like you try to do your best to see, OK, well, this are, obviously you want the service that they provide. But what else do they do beyond, yeah. you know, providing right. that service that helps promote your personal beliefs as a as a person and as a business? Yeah. Now, you mentioned I, I love it. You mentioned B Corp and I, and I have to go there. Tell our listeners particularly what I mean, what is a what is a B Corporation or why is it important? Yeah. So so here's the story that I heard. So. um and I believe this to be true because I was doing some some research of my own a, a while back, and it, it seemed like everything kind of lined up. The story is is that these uh, entrepreneurs created a very successful business, like hundreds of millions of dollars, kind of kind of thing, maybe even like a billion dollar business. And they were extremely extremely popular brand um, when I was growing up, um, and they were in the athletic space. Okay. And apparently, they, they um, remain nameless. <laughs> Oh, I, um, uh, I think I could. I think I could name it. Um, uh, don't, and, don't 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 go out of the limb on my account. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so yeah. um, but uh, the story goes is that they decided to sell their business and they sold it to an organization, and the organization that they sold it to essentially dismantled the whole vibe of the business. You right. know, it's like, well, that wait happens. a second. You sure. know, yeah, and yeah, right. That can happen when you get swallowed up, especially business. A, you know, a business that can buy like, you know, $100 million, billion dollar business, right? They're, they're going to be a big, a pretty big business, right? So, and they have their own culture, right? Sure. Um, so, so I guess the, uh, one of the co-founders of that company was just kind of disillusioned by it. And they said, you know what, there's got to be a better way to do, do things. So let's create a metric, uh, B Labs. They created an organization called B Labs. So that this, so that people and other businesses know that organizations that go for the B certification, the certified B Corp, they know that they have the systems in place that represent um, the values that other people appreciate. So, for example, you know, thankfully, is is this a is this a double edged sword? Thankfully, my business is small, um, and we we keep it small on purpose, you yeah. know, partly because we want to, you know be with our clients on a, uh, on a more um, personal basis. Right. But uh, you take a company like Bigelow, Bigelow, which is based in Fairfield, Connecticut. Okay. They're a certified B Corp. And I don't know how many employees they have, but going through that process as a two person firm, my company compared to Bigelow, 
I can't imagine what Bigelow has to go to. My process was extremely hard. I had to hire a consultant. And really? not only did my consultant get me through the process, I mean, I had to, uh, we had to create compliance manuals. I had to actually change my organization documents, my operating agreement, or, you know, some people might call it an LLC agreement. Uh, in the mm-hmm. corporate world, C Corps, you might call it like bylaws. So I actually had to change my operating agreement that said something along the lines of, you know, I'm using my business for a force for good. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right? But sure. I mean, there, there, are, there are actual things that I had to do. I, mean, I don't know how many compliance manuals I had to, I, think I had to set up like three or four more compliance manuals, you know, circling around how I conduct business and what we, you know, it's not only about doing business with other people and doing business for clients, but even like, how do I take out my trash? You know, <laughs> like little things like that. I mean, you know, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of joking about the trash, but it's, I mean, it's, it's even, it's even, you know, kind of down to that. Right. But it was a very involved process. It's extremely hard process. If I see other people that went through the process, one, I know they have probably very similar values to me and two, they're dedicated, they're dedicated to, to that personally and professionally. Now, why do you think you're the only investment corporation, the only investment company that is a B Corp? I mean, what's the what's holding others back? I mean, just oh, you know, the difficulty yeah. of, of going through that process is it, that what it, it could it could be. So this is this is only in Connecticut thus far. Yeah, and um, I've a sense uh, amended um, some of my materials because B Corp actually says, please don't try to. We're trying to be inclusive, not exclusive, right? Oh, oh, oh. okay. <laughs> so I've since amended some things. Here, yeah. Um, but we are we are currently the only B Corp. Um, financial advisor in Connecticut, anybody could go through the process of the financial advisor, you know, or any organization believes in it, you know, go right ahead and, and, and try to do it. Right. But it is, it is a very big barrier to entry. It, the cost might be part of it. The cost isn't too bad, but the work that you have to go or, you know, to actually get it is very cumbersome. And, and it really makes you reflect, you know, about like how you do want to conduct business. And, and that's that a good means, thing. Well, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, know so. <laughs> it, it, but it doesn't, it doesn't put restrictions on say, I don't know, profit margin or something. No, no, absolutely yeah. not. You can continue. Yeah. I mean, hopefully, I, I mean, I love it when businesses are created um, and I love how they impact, you know, um, the communities and uh, employees and all that. Yeah. Yeah. You can, if, if you make a billion dollars as a B Corp, go right ahead. Right? <laughs> they don't, they don't mind, but yeah, how you yeah. do it. Right. I mean, you know, your, your margins, the amount that you make doesn't really matter, but how you do it does. Right. Yeah, so yeah. you mentioned that you try to go local and that brings up the question for me because we're Connecticut based mm-hmm. a little bit myopic in that regard, but we do work regionally and then nationally as well. But so you kind of answer my question. Do you look primarily to Connecticut investment opportunities or is that that is a consideration. It may not be primary, but you're looking mm-hmm. uh, at, at Connecticut uh, investment opportunities. Right. So really I'm asking, you know, what have you done for us lately? What's, what's, <laughs> what, what, how do, how do community, how do Connecticut communities benefit from what you do? Right. So there's a couple of layers to this. Um, on an investment level, you can do private investments and there's a benefit that's come across my desk where I've invested in local company. One was based in Danbury. Another one was based actually just over the border in uh, the White Plains area. Okay. So it's like, oh, that's that's pretty close, right? So those are private private investment opportunities, and and you know the reason why we looked at those was because of the social impact, the environmental impact, and and the return potential. You know, sure. uh, quite honestly, but to do that as a private investor, you also have to meet like certain requirements, and we don't have to go into the details of like accredited investors and all that. So 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 there's that. There are other things that uh, a person can use if they want to invest locally. There's um, crowdfunding is a big thing. I don't know if you're familiar with crowdfunding, but it's oh, basically like oh, platforms. Oh, we are. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So there's basically platforms, right, that allow you to invest yeah. back into your community. And it could be maybe a loan, kind of like a, a bank providing a loan. You could be the lender sure. or you could you can own a piece of that company. So there's crowdfunding. Uh, as well. I'm sure Reset, uh, based out of Hartford, I bet you if, if if we walked in there, we could probably say, hey, does anybody need fun? You know, like they would probably say yes to take a look at this business. Um, but, uh, you know, what? another angle that we could actually take is um, things called donor advised funds um, for individuals and also qualified charitable distributions. 
So while I was talking about private investment before into companies for return, we can actually invest back into our communities, donor advised funds. Uh, we can put money into what's called the donor advised fund, uh, get a tax break for it, and then direct that donor advised fund to give back to sustainable CT or to the, maybe the Sierra club or right. the Autobahn, you know, like all these different organizations. So they have to be 501 C3 and they could also be private charities too. It just, it just depends. So, so that's one aspect of it. And then also um, a, a pretty nice tool for certain people for their IRAs, uh, your retirement account, you can actually do what's called a qualified charitable distribution. And it's kind of the same idea. It's like, oh, well, I don't really need to take my distribution from an IRA. Let me give it to this organization who is right. trying to promote, you know, our community and our, our, you know, our society. Yeah. Now we have, I mean, I don't know if there's a certain psychographic connection somehow to me. We have a community match fund that is, uh, it's funded by, by donor funds. Yeah. Right. And, uh, we then match, we we will go out and match m amounts up to a certain dollar amount in any community, any registered community in, in mm -hmm. Connecticut to do projects. It, it's, right. it's, it's, a, it's a grant system that is very, very simple, very easy. But yeah, we've had a lot of success with that. We're up to $4 million. I'm going to be five soon, uh, so far invested. And we're coming on our fifth year with that. So it's been, mm -hmm. been a huge deal. But you're right. We, I mean, so we're kind of a source, small source. This is right. not hundreds of thousands of dollars out of pop. It's mm -hmm. 15,000, you know, it's 8,000, 15,000, that, 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 right. that size, but it helps uh, community leaders do things that they really want to do in their community. Oh. oh yeah. I mean that, I mean, that makes a big difference in a lot of these organizations. I mean, they really rely on, I mean, they rely on that type of funding, right? Yeah. So yeah. That, that's how they get work done. You know, interestingly, just, I'll, I'll just go back to the 1% for the planet really quick. Um, that was their mission. They said, Hey, if you're a 1% for the planet member, your your duty as a one percent for the plan member is to take one percent of your revenue, and then donate it to okay. you know an, a qualified organization. Tithing. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> so yeah, we've done that. We've done that um, uh, locally. We've we've donated locally as part of one percent for the planet too to organizations that help promote those you know environmental and social causes. That's fantastic. Now, how do you how do you? Uh, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but you must have some way of qualifying the organizations or individuals that you're, you're donating to, how do you, uh, oh, do you how do you, yeah, do you out? you're absolutely right. So as a matter of fact, the two organizations that I donated that I, you know, my company, if I, if I say I, I mean, I'm, nah, I'm I get company. it. <laughs> so the two organizations that we donated to, we had relationships with and we said, Hey, I don't see you on the 1% for the planet environmental partners membership. Let me get you in contact with them. And then they had to go through a, uh, just a, a screening. Okay. So it's, it's not, I don't think it was too cumbersome. I didn't have to go through that part, but yeah, I mean, uh, sustainable CT, would you qualify? I mean, yeah, you, maybe we should look into that, right? Yeah, I think you'd <laughs> probably qualify. Yeah. yeah you would, I mean, <laughs> the, the amount of work that you've done in the, in these towns yeah. in Connecticut is, is pretty remarkable, right? I'd sure yeah. you, you, it'd be pretty easy for you, for you all to qualify. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know, funding is always an issue for us uh, it, cause we can always do more with more. I mean, that's right. what I, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, yeah, that's always an issue. Let's take a break here a second. I want to come back and ask about you because <laughs> we, okay, got, we got off on a tangent. My fault. I kind of led down a, a path and, and I kind of skipped over. I want to actually, actually ask about you and some of your motivations and why you're in this business and whatnot, but we'll come right back to that. Give us Sounds a good. Answer. All right. We'll return to our program in just a moment. You've been listening to The Impact, a sustainable CT podcast. Hey, while you're out there tripping the web fantastic, don't forget to join us on Facebook for some fun and interesting stuff. Guaranteed safe for children and pets. Come on, be our friend, won't you? At facebook.com slash sustainable CT. And we, like millions of others, have hopped on the Instagram threads bandwagon at instagram.com slash sustainable CT and threads dot net at sustainable ct and yes of course we're linked in search for sustainable ct from your linkedin page and you'll find us right there being all linkedin and media social and if you're not yet a subscriber to actions and impact the sustainable ct newsletter you could be missing out on some very important information to you to your organization and to your town except no substitutes do yourself a favor and subscribe today and you can do that where at sustainable ct dot org of course and it's time, yes, it's time to save the date. That's right, mark it on your calendars, folks. The 2024 Sustainable CT Awards celebration will be on Wednesday, November 13th. 
We'll be honoring all of our 2024 certified towns and a brand new cohort of climate leaders, too. We'll also be celebrating five years of community match fund success. Five years! Holy mackerel, where does the time go? And what is very cool is that we'll be doing this all at the Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center, the Kate in Old Saybrook. The Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center is a nonprofit performing arts organization located in an historic theater town hall on Main Street in Old Saybrook. Originally opened in 1911, the building is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Catherine Hepburn Museum, located on the first floor, is the only museum of its kind honoring Catherine Hepburn, Old Saybrook's most celebrated resident. Exhibits feature costumes and personal wardrobe items, photographs, home movies, awards, and other memorabilia. How can you beat that, really? Space is limited, so we encourage you to register early at Warehouse SustainableCT.org. Your hard work and continuing support are vital importance to us, so we look forward to seeing you at the Kate in Old Saybrook on November 13th. And of course, sponsorship opportunities are available for this event. Why, yes, by sponsoring our 2024 awards celebration, you'll be aligned with our reputation as a trusted and valuable support program for municipalities and an innovative thought leader in building thriving, sustainable communities. Don't wait. Contact Jessica LeClaire. 860-259-4767 to discuss options and details. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking to James Osborne, and he's with uh, Invest Asset Management. We're having a great conversation. And I kind of skipped over. We went down a path. I know I want to get back and ask him about, about him and ask him about how he got into this. So yeah, it's a lot, uh, easier, I, a lot easier topic. <laughs> <laughs> I was fascinated to read that you were a chemical engineer. So what? Tell me, because I've known a few of those. My father was a chemical engineer, <laughs> and I can't imagine him being... So tell me what, uh, how, what motivates a chemical engineer to get into uh, socially responsible investment or even oh, just investment for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when, when when you're young, you just don't know enough about what you really want in the world, <laughs> right? So, yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I I love math and science, and you know, if you if you if you knew me, you'd probably know that I I like watching like those science documentaries and things on TV f- about that stuff. Um, but yeah, growing up, it was it was uh, I went to school and. I guess kind of growing up, you, you don't know too much about what can be offered in the world. So I grew up in a, in a fairly small town. I mean, yes, there were people that did finance. I didn't, I didn't know them. You know, um, there were people that did investment management. I didn't really know them growing up. It seems up. like a foreign world to so many of us. It, well, yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, my, my career after business school was investment banking. I'd never heard of that until I was actually in college. Hmm. And, and for that matter, it was more like my junior year of college. You know, in my mind, it was like, okay, well, I, I got to become an engineer, and chemical engineering was kind of cool. Um, but, but this is where things kind of started diverging was my junior, senior year, and I started learning more about finance. What was interesting about that was I started learning more about finance, but I still wanted to give engineering a shot. But my first job offer came from an organization based out of Long Island, and they're still in business. Uh, wonderful, wonderful family-run organization. Um, they do um, they do consulting, engineering consulting. And they hired me as an environmental engineer. So that's, I thought I was going to work for, there you know, you we were talking about, I thought I was going to work for Snoco or Exxon, I mean, the, or, or uh, maybe a pharmaceutical company because they recruited at Villanova. I ended up working at environmental, as an environmental engineer at an engineering consulting company. And that's where my path really went down this Holy cow! I really I do care about the environment way more than I ever thought I did. Right, right. So, so that got me down that path. When I realized that I love the environment, I respect engineers and the work that they do. It's extremely difficult and hard. But I said it wasn't for me personally. Sure. So that's when I went back to business school and I started going like the full finance route. Right. So when I was getting my degree in finance, there was all these different types of uh, investment banking uh, related opportunities. You could do like mergers and acquisitions. You could do um, equities research. You can do all these different things. I particularly like a part of banking called a municipal finance or social infrastructure finance. Okay. Um, and what I liked about that is it paired my engineering background, which I loved with the finance background. So we would find, we would we would raise money for schools, hospitals, roads, um, public utilities, things like that, right? So those things could be built and they bettered our community. Right. So I worked for a very big organization 
but they laid off everybody in my entire division. <laughs> and I could I could go down a whole rabbit hole story about oh, what happened on the day that I got to the, you know, back in yeah. back in 2008, right? Financial crisis, right? Yeah. I was working for that organization. Uh, they laid everybody off the entire division. I don't know, four or 500 people, maybe more. And I was lucky enough to find a job very quickly. And that took me down the renewable energy path, but similar, you know, in the, in the banking path. This was called project finance, where you could build solar farms and wind farms and other renewable energy producing uh, assets based off of the cash flow that they that they generate because they're selling power or energy right. to a utility or, or somebody, right? And and we could we could actually loan them money off of that. So that took me down that path. And and the person that I worked for there decided to start a private equity fund. He said, James, come join me. And I said, okay, sure, why not? So I did that with them, <laughs> where before I was a lender, now I was an owner, along with, you know, big in, we call it institutional money, with big institutional money. We were owners of these facilities and and running them rather than a lender, just you know, picking up a check. Uh, and then there, there just came a point where I just said, you know what, it's nice F from a scale standpoint, you know, our portfolio was, was fairly big. And, and we did a study, this was a long time ago when I was working for them, but we did a study and it said the amount of carbon, carbon dioxide that we displaced was equivalent to like trees that would cover the entire state of Connecticut. So like think of Connecticut but nothing but trees, right? Like that's how much carbon we displaced or, or, or removed, which, which is great, right? But it was also one of those things like, well, I'm helping like billion dollar institutions make more money. Right. Let me see if I can do something <laughs> more, more personal, right? So, right. Yeah. so that's, what, that's what got me into the personal investing side of things. But I was, it was my MBA that got me into finance. But along those same lines, it's like, okay, just because I know finance doesn't necessarily know, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that I know personal investing. It just so happened that, and that's a skill that you learn over time. A, a lot of people learn it over time because it's really not taught in schools. No, it's not. But yeah, I, I took my time to learn that alongside, you know, while I was, while I was doing these, we call them deals, while I was doing these deals and these projects, I was also learning a lot more about personal investing and how I could, you know, do better for me personally and my family. And then I, you know, I started taking classes and, and more recently was the CPWA out of Yale was, was that well, on, on another level, too, it actually does make a whole lot of sense. You have this, this scientific grounding, most particularly as an engineer, in a, in a field, if you're looking to invest in these, in, in, these are really engineering grounded investment opportunities, especially in energy, you know, you're not selling widgets. You're, right, right. you're, in, you're investing in the future in this, this is, this is some stuff that really needs to be grounded scientifically. Right. And you have, you have a complete uh, perception of that because you've, you have a con you have a clearer concept of it than most people would for right. sure. You know. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So when did when did you start Envest? You started it uh, It was like late 2018. Okay. Uh and then Karen my partner joined uh it's been about 2 years now at the end of 2022. But she and I had worked together in the past uh on a nonprofit board together and we really liked each other a lot. She has I don't mean data. She has more more experience than I do. Has an unbelievable background. She was actually on the board of finance here in in town in, in Ridgefield, our town. And she had sent she had since moved to uh, Vermont. But we had a very very similar philosophy on a lot of things. And we got talking. And she's an empty nester. And she said, "Hey, I'm going to move to Vermont. I don't want to work in Manhattan anymore. Let's see if we can, you know, let's let's partner together." And I said, "Oh yeah, that'd be great." So it's it's been a wonderful partnership. I'm so glad that she joined. Now let me let me ask you the the brass tax question, which is just it's a philosophical conundrum, especially on the progressive side of my political milieu. We get into these debates all the time. Can capitalism, can investing, be socially responsible? Because if you're talking about the fidu the single fiduciary responsibility of you know is is profit, right? And, you know, is maximizing profit. Yeah. And as much as we want to dress that up and say, well, look, we want we're 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 trying to do this in a responsible way. We want to think about the future and our kids and the planet and everything else. The bottom line is, if we're not making money, mm -hmm. it's it's going to be a problem. Right. How do you square that circle or circle that square or however, they, whatever? They no, I, I know. Yeah, this I mean, this could lead a whole rabbit hole, right? This is like a well, whole, I, rabbit whole rabbit hole. <laughs> So, we yeah, like to try to make people think. In no, this show. no, it just, yeah, it just, yeah, it's, cra it's crazy that, you know, 
there's a saying, go woke, go broke. It's like, are you really, really? Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break. That is not how things work. So I, you know, I, I think there's some theories that was it Milton Friedman, University of Chicago, penned a letter to New York Times back in the 70s and said, oh, the corporation's fiduciary responsibility is not to the community, it's to, you know, profit. To the and I think that gave, yeah, shareholders. And what's really funny around that time when that was penned, you can see executive compensation greatly diverge away from employee compensation. It was like more like, you know, two times, you know, three times. Now it's like a hundred times. Yeah. Know? 400 <laughs> times. Yeah, yeah, 400 not, times. It's ridiculous. Absolutely right? insane. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, I mean, if, if you look at that, I, and part, I, I've read it before and, and the last time I read it was a while ago, but I remember reading something that struck me. It was, it was that he actually mentions that something along the lines of it's not a company's responsibility to support their community. So that tells me that that was in his thoughts and people did that beforehand. Right. So yeah. it was, it, it's been there for years and then, and then it diverged around when he penned this, penned this article. Okay. So anyway, now, now there's this big divergence and now everybody thinks that, Oh, you know, when you're capitalism, you can't do these things. I would argue, no, if anything, if COVID has taught us anything, it's like, you really need to know, even if you don't believe in it from a um, ethical standpoint, even though I do think ethics do come into a play, because I do think it's the board and the management's fiduciary responsibility to make sure that they decrease risks as best that they can. And COVID has, has brought that to the forefront, right? So, so I would say, wait a second, it is your responsibility to better understand your supply chain which is part of sustainability, which is part of ESG, right? Right. It's your responsibility to understand the environmental impacts of your supply. You know, like like Pepsi, what would they do if they couldn't get any more, you know, wheat? You know, like how are they shoring that stuff? You know, like, or, or I don't know, Kellogg's, or, right? Or clean water, yeah. Or, or clean water, yeah, and that's a big, <laughs> that's a big issue. Clean water yeah. is a big issue. It's going to be huge, right? It's going to be a, a really big issue. I know, As, you know, I, I realize there is a, there's a natural tension there. And we, we just have to, Let's, you know, see the elephant in the room. There's a natural tension between, you know, profit and ethics. There, mm -hmm. there has to be. Okay. But I have always argued, and, and again, this goes back to where my working with some companies. We're all, when you talk about, well, Friedman's notion that we're not here to benefit the community, that's bullshit. You are part of the community. You are part of the You yeah. live and breathe <laughs> the air that we live in and, and yep. breathe. You drive on the same streets. You have yeah. the same, you know. Now, you could you could say, well, these are multinational corporations, and they're you know live in penthouses, and they're separated, they're, and all of that. Again, that is true, and that is kind mm -hmm. of a, a part of the thing we need to just acknowledge. Right. But all of the employees, and you're right, the distribution centers and the the lines of uh, all of the all of this is now so integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, companies that don't take the community they could do in the community seriously. They do that at their peril, right? They you do know, that's peril, just yeah. crazy. Yeah, uh, you got to have a sense of of you know responsibility for the community because you're in it. You know, mm -hmm. and, and you're trying. And Elias, are you trying to yeah. sell to it? Yeah, these are your customers. If nothing oh. else, you know. You <laughs> yeah, yeah, and your natural resources too. It's like you know, you can, you can't waste your natural resources. You got to be you got to be smart about your natural resources. Some of them won't ever come back. You know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Now, I think that another tension that we have to recognize is the difference between short-term and long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. And there is an awful lot of short-term thinking in the, in the yeah. financial world and in, in the uh, capitalist world mm -hmm. that that really does cut your nose off to spice your face to mix a few metaphors. I, I don't know how to get, get past that sometimes. It, it drives me crazy. If mm -hmm. you just look beyond the next quarter. Uh, you know, to be able to yeah. see something five or 10, hell, even 50 years down the road. Yeah. A little and you're taking the words right out of my mouth. I mean, that's exactly right. There, there have been, I, I've, I've read in the past, I haven't seen it more recently, but I've read in the past things like some companies, uh, publicly traded companies have said, I don't care about quarterly announcements anymore. Like it's just too much, it's too much work and it's too, it, it's too volatile and it sends the wrong message. You know, I don't know if I've actually seen anybody take it any further <laughs> since I've heard it. But, yeah. but I mean, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, you do need to think for, so from a, from a personal standpoint and what my clients are trying to do as well, it's like, okay, a lot of it is geared towards long-term financial goals. 
So we need organizations to be long-term and profitable long-term so that my clients can also meet. I can't promise anything, but you know, <laughs> yeah. the goal is, is that, you know, we have companies, we're investing in companies as shareholders, we're owners in that company. Hopefully they last a long time and they produce profits and they do, they produce profits um, responsibly. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, we're constantly told to invest for the, for the long haul. Yeah. To create generational wealth, to think of, you know, whatever your legacy you're leaving right. to your kids or grandkids. And yet some of these companies don't, you know, they don't seem to think of that as being you know, good right. advice for their, for, so, for their stuff, for so, themselves. So, yeah. you know, we were, we were talking about uh, earlier about um, greenwashing and whether or not there's going to be a move towards more, more consistent reporting, you know? Yeah. I, and and, and I, I do think that's a big fear, but th this comes along like the long, long-termism. Um, one of the one of the bigger things that came out of the Supreme Court uh, not too long ago was the um, was the Chevron case. You know, they call it the Chevron case, right? Yeah. And and my my big fear is that because that was overturned, which gave you know certain powers to government agencies to create laws that you know help protect the public. Right. That's kind of my big fear. Is like our company is going to go swing, you know way back is the pendulum going to swing the other direction so far that we we were decades back from where we were like that's to me we'll, we'll see what we'll see what happens i mean it's only been a month now since that was overturned or even a month I, i'm not really can't remember the exact date but yeah that kind of that that kind of scares me but if if organizations are thinking long term they're thinking about their consumers and their customers and their communities then then hopefully that will be an issue yeah. i'm hoping <laughs> Uh, and the, the root of that decision was that oh no, this is this is these are rules and regulations that Congress should be creating, should be responsible for. And I and I and I when I read, it's just I don't know. We have a court majority now that thinks we live in 1793 mm -hmm. or so. If yeah. you think that that our current Congress has the has the expert level of expertise and the ability oh. to actually function yeah, at that level. Like Oh, it's it, it it it's insane. It's it insane. blows my mind. It's like, yeah, let me. You're a communications expert. Let me. I'll come in and tell you how to do your job. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. what are you talking about, Chase? You, know, you know anything about nuts. You know anything about communications? I will say though that you know capitalism has evolved. It's not immune to the pressures around it, and even it evolved right. even in spite of itself on occasion uh, to in order to survive. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. has that. You know, the old yarn. Of, you know, if there wasn't FDR and the New Deal, then we'd probably have ended up. Losing capitalism because it was a desperate situation in the 30s. And things have evolved over time. And and I think that capitalism is more socially responsible than it was. This isn't, you know, Dickens. We're not, mm -hmm. we're not. <laughs> the, the draconian era of capitalism, I think, should, is is behind us. But now right. it just becomes much more of a, a an interesting, difficult game with Rust and Perry and these and if the issues like, you know, the court coming in and Setting things back a generation, yeah. with, you know, mm -hmm. pronouncements. Let me ask you this. What, as long as I have you here, what do you consider to be the most intriguing, most promising uh, investment area in the future? And we're not, be clear, we're not asking for yeah, investment not, advice here. No but, investment, but what's, no what's, investment what's, advice here. You know, is it, is it all about energy? I mean, or is there something I'm missing? Is it, uh, what, what else is there out there? That's no, really certainly, doing? certainly that's part of it. So I like to say uh, diversification is key, right? So we'll say diversification is key. Even organizations that are can I'll call them conglomerates, like your Walmarts or you know your Pepsi's or your Coca Colas. It's like yeah, they're known for one or two, well, one or two products. I mean, they own like a bunch of products, right? yeah. but they have their hands in all these different types of businesses. Sure. They can use ESG, and they do use ESG, environmental social governance metrics, to you know better prepare themselves, right? Um, supposedly. So, so there's that aspect of it, but the ones that I like particularly, uh, I like grid technology a lot, right? So this is going down my renewable energy path, like my background and engineering background. The grid, the energy grid wastes so much energy. So it, I, I think, I want to say below 50%. Yeah. I'd have to look. I know, um, I think it's, uh, is it NREL? I can't remember. EPA, NREL, um, maybe the DOE. But, but you know, one of these major organizations actually monitors how much how much is lost, right? And it's it's ridiculous how much energy is actually physically lost throughout our grid. So yeah. having a, a better grid will help shore up, you know, those losses for sure, uh, and make it a lot more efficient. Plus, plus the intermittency of solar and wind, like I, I, you know, that's that's something that grid technology can help with. So I do like grid stuff. I like I've always liked water resource related things. 
I've also liked uh, environmental related things, uh, even things like waste management, you know, picking up trash, composting, if there's organizations that do that. I mean, that has... Which a, is a huge need in Connecticut. It's going to be a huge need, yeah. <laughs> and we have laws, you know, that promote um, composting here, right? It's, yeah. a, you know, to get those things built, though, is, is fairly expensive, right? So you, you need pretty deep pockets. So I, I like, I like water. I like environmental services. Um, I like grid, you know, if those are, if those are some of the ones that if you said, James, you like, what do you like? It's like, those are the ones that I like a lot. I mean, the, the grid is fascinating because you're right. It's, it, it's a leaky sieve. It's a really, hot. Yeah. It's been built as a hodgepodge over the last hundred years. And mm -hmm. it, it's not like anybody laid out a plan. And as a result, it's just, yeah, it's very inefficient and right. very and aging rapidly mm -hmm. uh, and built for, you know, old technology yeah. by, by and for old technology. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's a very interesting uh, future of that. Let me ask you this. What keeps you hopeful? What makes you, because I, I ask this of everybody who comes to the show, because I need, I need some advice. I get, I got like, uh, you know, the, the stuff that we're up against just seems overwhelming sometimes. Right. And so I get, I have my periods. I get down to, are we doing enough? How can we possibly mm -hmm. do enough to make a real difference? Yep. How do you, how do you stay hopeful in what you're doing? And, and Oh yeah, no, no. Uh, I have two kids. So, um, you know, I, I, I love, I love my family and I, I love thinking that uh, I'm trying to do better for them. Hmm. Young people, you know, young, young people, I, I think uh, Gen, I'm Gen X, but you know, Gen Z, they, I think their voice, there's so, they're so tech savvy that they know how to, it feels like, yeah, they know how to organize really well and they know how to get their voices heard really well. So I'm really hopeful that they're, they're, they're making a difference. And some of the most impressive people that I've met in Connecticut, I mean, they were, they were much younger than I thought they would have been, you know, at the time, like early twenties, some of them were even teenagers. And I was, I was really surprised. I'm like, wow, you really are. You're doing way more than a lot of people, you know, would ever do. So I'm really, I'm really, I really like, I'm really hopeful with the uh, Gen Z and I'm sure that those that come um, after them will, will hopefully pick up the mantle as well. And I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, we should all be doing our part, right? Yeah. <laughs> and organizations, I mean, I remember when I first heard about sustainable CT, it was actually still in your infancy. It's like, wow, what you've, what you've accomplished you know, in the short time that you've been around, is it, <clears throat> I mean, to, to be able to create something like that so that the entire, you know, Everybody, every town knows about in Connecticut and they all know that they can do something better. Right. And, and you're spearheading that and, and guiding, guiding these. And it's not only, it's not only about um, doing better for the environment, but I'm, you know, saving money and growing the communities. Right. And sure. yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. The, the, the generation coming up behind us and I shouldn't say uh, I'm an old guy and uh, I, you know, my generation, we came to this, we came to the party late and mm -hmm. I have, ha I've had people, uh, young people tell me in earnest, you screwed up. Right. And I, and I own that. I do. I think, I think my generation colleagues of my age, uh, we, right. we screwed up and mm -hmm. we're, we're leaving, uh, you know, a lot of work to be done by, the generations coming up behind us, and yeah. thankfully they're very smart, mm -hmm. and they grew up with this whole notion of a warming planet and stuff that needs to be done. When I was a kid, and I thought twice about this, I had to, right. you know, I had to, we had to learn this and mm -hmm. how, how dumb that was, but true. So, um, yeah, it's I, I'm really so hopeful much. for the next generation. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. James, we are out of time. That went. That went. Zoom by, didn't it? See? You know? Yeah, Jim, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, thank you for having me here. It was a lot of, it was, it was great to be a part of this. Yeah, wait, I mean, I could go on, we could go on for a while, but, you know, I don't, I think we better, we better, we, everything, every, and I, and everything good has to end at some point. So we have mm -hmm. to, we have to wrap this up. I want to thank you again for being here. Very much appreciate it. And it was a fascinating conversation. I love to, I love to hear that, your, your perspective on this. I think it's, uh, well done. Well done. Right. Well, th thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not perfect, but you know, we, we, we always try to do our best, right? We always, we're, we're always trying to do better. Well, so. keep on keeping on my friend. All right. Thank you. Jim. Thank you. Bye. -bye. We hope you've enjoyed today's edition of The Impact, a sustainable CT podcast. As always, this program is recorded, produced and copyrighted. Yeah. By sustainable CT. 
Thank you for your interest. Thank you for listening. Thank you to our sponsor, the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut. Thanks again to our good friend James Osborne for his support, his candor, and everything he does to make the oil and water mix. And thanks to everyone for taking local actions that have a statewide impact.